basically the focus of today's module is on reinforcement learning and control from the perspective of uh, graphical models. So again, the goal uh, of the module is to give you some gentle introduction to RL. So we're going to cover some pretty basic concepts such as Markov decision processes and value functions. Uh, this lecture, yeah, uh, and then we'll, we'll focus on the connection to inference uh, and learning in graphical models. So here's a quick note on the material uh, we used in this module, which is mostly uh, the reinforcement introduction, Sutton's and Bartu book. Uh, some David Silver's lectures, and uh, a lot of the material is actually based on work of Sergey Levin's group from UC Berkeley, uh, and his tutorial from last year on RL and control as, and control as inference. We've already seen reinforcement learning uh, in one of the previous lectures, actually. Zidang introduced, introduced it uh, uh, last Wednesday when he introduced the problem of text generation. And what he showed is that they can generalize the standard objective for text generation models, for encoder-decoder models, and add this term, right? Uh, which is an expectation of some reward function with respect to the encoder-decoder, uh, and where we have some generated sequence y, and then we have some golden, uh, golden sequence y star, right? So the, the thing is that this term is non-differentiable, uh, and therefore we need to find a way to optimize it somehow with respect to parameters of the initial distribution. So these problems are pretty common. Uh, so, this, so this problem, or this optimization problem, um, actually is pretty common in RL, uh, and it comes up uh, in, in various contexts, but basically the, the more, the more, in the more general form it's given on the slide, where we have uh, some function that, it, that is a black box function of our output of our distribution that generates samples. And the only thing that we can do, we can evaluate this function and get a scalar value, right? We will not be able to associate directly, you know, the value of the function that it outputs with the parameters of the generating distribution. So we need to find a way to somehow optimize it. Um, but let's, let's focus first on, on the, some basics of RL. So in this lecture, I'll focus on the framework and mainly introduce the concepts. In the next lecture, we're going to go into the algorithms. Uh, just a quick show of hands. Who is familiar with reinforcement learning, or at least like read maybe a couple of chapters of books? Okay. All right, cool. Uh, it's like 50-50. Good. All right, so um, we're pretty familiar with the, you know, with the main paradigms of machine learning. Right? It's supervised learning and unsupervised learning, where we typically assume that we're given a data, a data set that is sampled from some distribution, uh, and all the samples are identically uh, distributed and in independent. And then our goal is either to approximate the conditional distribution where we separate the variables into two parts, right, into x and y. And the downstream task that we're trying to, to accomplish is that given some x, we will not, we will not have y at test time, so we'd like to predict these missing variables, right? Uh, in unsupervised learning, we'd like to model the entire distribution. So we can use unsupervised models to sort of infill uh, these variables. So what graphical models uh, allow us, they allow us to efficiently represent, manipulate, and perform learning and inference on these probability distributions. And as we have seen in the deep learning module, um, deep learning gives us tools to actually build very expressive probability distributions. Right, and, le uh, and sort of learn representations, latent representations um, that can efficiently represent the meaning of the data. Uh, RL is slightly different. We no longer have a data set. Now, what we're given is an environment with a certain interface that our algorithm or agent or policy can perceive and interact with. Uh, and um, the goal of the agent or controller or a policy uh, is to maximize some sort of utility in this environment that you put it in. And this utility is represented by the reward. Um, so the question is like, why do we care about sequential decision making and RL in general? And while uh, supervised learning and unsupervised learning is a tool for a human mainly, right? We build a model out of the data that we can later on use to, in, to guide and inform our decisions. Uh, with RL, we sort of have this more, I would say, futuristic view where we'd like to build an intelligent machine ultimately that would be able to interact with the world and make decisions on their own 
that can perceive the world and, and try to optimize certain utility functions that we either specify for them as humans or maybe they infer from markets they participate in. So maybe another, uh, another point why we're interested in RL these days so much is because there are a lot of uh, recent success stories. So what we know today is that if we have a really good simulator of the environment, um, we uh, can efficiently learn it and actually outperform humans. And examples of this would be the uh, game of Go or maybe uh, the StarCraft II environments. Uh, the, another hope is that if we have access to an imperfect simulator, maybe uh, we, even with the imperfect simulator, we can try to learn a policy that would be able to control uh, the agent in that simulator and maximize the utility and accomplish certain goals. And then, after we've learned in the simulator, hopefully it will somehow transfer into the real world. And it's a very active uh, area of research in robotics. Uh, there is much more work than what is shown on the slides right now. Uh, but these are some notable, notable recent works. OK, so but we'll not focus on all these applications. In this lecture, we're going to look at actually the basic concepts and build the blocks of RL today. Um, so the first concept, uh, or the first building block, is uh, the Markov decision process. That sort of abstracts away this agent and environment thing into literally two components. So first we have an environment that has uh, some set of states. And we, have, uh, we allow the agent to perceive the environment by observing the states. And given a state, the agent is able to take an action from a set of all possible actions. Then once the agent takes an action, the action is submitted to the environment. Uh, the environment processes this action and somehow transitions from the previous state to the next state uh, according to some transition probability. Finally, we define a utility function uh, through a reward function, which is, which is given here, RSA. Uh, generally, rewards are random variables. So, States are random variables. Trans after, transition, uh, after transition happens in the environment, we get another random variable for the next state, given the previous state in action. Action could be a random variable. Reward can be a random variable. But we, uh, for simplicity, for simplicity uh, purpose, we will focus on just this deterministic reward function, which is the expectation of the reward given the state in an action. Uh, the environment is Markovian. Uh, due to this property of the, of the transition function, where the next state depends basically on the previous state and action only. Uh, but the environments could be non-Markovian, could be partially observable. We're not going to go into any of this. So finally, we can characterize the life of our agent or the trajectory in the environment just simply as the sequence of uh, state action and reward tuples over time. Um, so the question, what can we do with MDPs? Right, and there are at least two things we can do. So one thing is, given an environment, we can try to learn a policy that would output actions, given the states, such that the cumulative reward over the lifetime of the agent or over the trajectory is maximized. Um, so this is the, this is the, the goal of, of policy search. And the other thing that we can do with MDPs is trying to actually identify the MDP that the agent is in. So let's say, uh, or, or identify the reward function. So let's say we're given a bunch of trajectories, and those are our data, which puts us back actually into the supervised learning setting. And then from these trajectories that may be generated by a human expert or by someone else, we'd like to infer what is the likely reward function would have been if we had a rational agent that try to optimize that reward function and generated these trajectories. Right, so we're trying to basically infer the reward from, from collected data. Um, so let's introduce a few, uh, a few more notation. So we'll say that return or cumulative reward starting at step t will be this uh, gt function, which is basically forward-looking rewards uh, from current step onwards. Um, if t, capital T, is equal to infinity, we can actually introduce the, the discounted return uh, and every single reward obtained by the agent in the future will be discounted by some factor gamma. So we get some exponential discounting of the, of the future rewards. Uh, 
And basically what this says, it, it says that the rewards that I obtain in the future are much less sort of uh, important at this point in time than the rewards that they can get immediately. At the same time, uh, you know, it's a geometric series, so given a certain gamma, there is you know, a certain expected number of time steps after which uh, none of the rewards actually matter. So basically, it softly sort of imposes this uh, horizon on, on the MDP. So the next thing, having introduced this return fun uh, function, we can now take the expectation of the return with respect to policy. And of course, with respect to the, uh, to the transition dynamics. But I will just omit this transition dynamics from the expectation from, from now until on all, on all the slides. Um, so what we see here is actually our stochastic objective, right? Right, um, so we would like to optimize you know, all the returns from now, discount, some of discounted returns from now into the future uh, under the given policy, if we were to try to find a policy that would maximize the, the value function. So, but basically what the value function says, or state value function, um, it says if I'm in state S and I would start following policy pi, what would be the expected return that I can get from this state. Um, another uh, value function that is called state action value function, or a Q function, says basi basically says pretty, mu pretty much the same thing, but it also conditions on the first action. So given that I'm in the state S, and I take the action A, what would be my expected sum of discounted ret uh, rewards? Right? Um, so for these, uh, for these value functions, we have some sort of recurrent relationships, uh, which are expressed by the Bellman equations. So, and on this slide, uh, I'm writing down the Bellman equation for, for the value function of a state S. So right now it's just the definition of the value function, but we can expand the return uh, from just you know, a single return to you know, the most immediate reward and then gamma multiplied by the return starting the next step, right? Uh, then after that, what we can do, we'll expand the first step. So we'll say we're gonna take the first action with respect to policy pi, and then after that, we're gonna make a transition uh, with respect to the environment dynamics. And then after you do that, you will just, we'll just expand this term and we'll write out RT plus one as a function of S and A. And then the rest of the steps will be shuffled into this expectation, right? Uh, so basically we can expand and relate actually uh, the value function at state S with the value function at one of the next states. And then the way we, we get to the next states, we take an action with respect to a policy and then transition according to, to the dynamics of the environment. So we can represent this uh, with the diagram given in the slide, right? So to compute the value of a state uh, S, we first need to expand from the state along the actions, along all the possible actions. And then from every action, we again expand down uh, along the all possible or admissible transitions, right? And then assuming that we can, we have already values for all the other states at the bottom level, we can just back up and just multiply these values with the corresponding probabilities, sum them together again, back up and get to the root point in the tree where we'll compute the value of the value function. Any questions about that? Pretty clear, okay. So here's an example uh, of a grid world uh, from Sutton and Barter's book. So it's a pretty simple grid world and the rules are given uh, in the bullet points on the top of the slide. Uh, basically an agent can move uh, in four directions from any cell and then if the agent is one of the corner cells and tries to move, let's say, into a wall, in this case, um, the agent will get negative reward and nothing will happen. Otherwise, the agent will just move to the adjacent cell. And if you're in cell A or B, right, uh, 
Uh, whatever you do, you'll just move to the corresponding A prime or B prime, you'll get some positive reward. So on the right hand side, we have this uh, state value function or the V function for every state S under the random policy. Right, so if the agent walks absolutely at random, we basically can try and go and compute the value of every state under this policy. And we'll see that the values maybe at the bottom row are pretty negative, and then the higher we get to these A and B, they start becoming positive because of the positive rewards. So similar Bellman equation could be written for the uh, state action value function. Right, we'll expand it in the same manner. So first we'll push out the first reward that does not have any uncertainty because we condition on the state in action, right? Then we'll put out the gamma, we'll compute this expectation of the returns, uh, and we'll expand them again. Now we'll expand them with respect to the transition probability first here, and then with respect to, again, the taken action from a new state under policy pi, right? So what we'll get, we'll get Again, a, recur a re recurrent relationship between q pi s a and q pi s prime a prime. Right, so basically we can uh, write this relationship between any pair of uh, states. So similarly, we get the same diagram for the q function, where uh, the q function at the root of the node can be again, recursively computed by expanding and then backing up. Um, so the value functions that I introduced so far weren't optimal. So they were for a policy that we decided to plug in and run under. And given a policy, we can compute all these values for every state or state action pair. Uh, but to solve IRL, as I mentioned, we have the stochastic objective that we try to optimize. We would like to optimize with respect to the policy. So we'd like to find a policy that actually would maximize our uh, our expected returns, right? And to define it a bit more formally, we can say that pi is better or equal than pi prime uh, if the expected return is greater or equal uh, for pi than, than for pi prime uh, in every state, right? So this is an if and only if kind of statement. Uh, and so we can actually uh, try to find the uh, optimal value function or the optimal Q function with respect to the policy. So uh, what I'm gi giving you on the slide here and here. And without actually going into derivation and details, you can, uh, you can show that these recurrent relationships hold for this optimal value functions. Note that the only difference from the previous uh, Bellman equations, what we get here is instead of trying to optimize, so oh, sorry, instead of trying to sum over all possible actions that the policy can output from the current state, you're just trying to maximize or trying to, to find the, the value that would be maximized with respect to an action, right? So what it says basically is that if you have an optimal value function or the optimal Q function to compute uh, its value at, let's say, state SA, you'll need to expand according to the dynamics. And then whenever you take an action, you'll just pick the, most, the best action in a greedy manner because the, uh, the Q function or the V function are already optimal. All right. So pictorially, Pictoria is the same uh, backup diagram right now, but now with, these, uh, with this max operators that we added in. Right, so whenever we're transitioning from the state node, which is the uh, white circle, to the action node, which is the black circle, we'll apply the max operator. Um, okay. Now the question, how do we, uh, how do we recover now the optimal policy? Uh, and uh, in a simple MDP like this, we could, uh, we could recover, so once we, have action to the, uh, once we have access to the optimal Q, Q function, we can recover the optimal policy as just a delta function over the, the optimal, optimal action 
right? So basically, our optimal policy that we can recover from this Q star will be deterministic. Okay? And then to recover the optimal trajectory, um, we'll just run the optimal policy and we'll uh, follow, follow the dynamics of the environment under this optimal policy. So we'll get this tau star as the optimal trajectories. And we can sample basically from the distributions of optimal trajectories. Uh, so this is the same grid world example that I showed you before. And now we are actually computing the V star and pi star. And as you can see, we no longer have these negative, uh, negative values because our policy is not random. It doesn't bump into the walls. It learned that you, know, you need to follow certain um, trajectories to get to the high reward, high reward states. OK. Um, so quick recap of this super brief intro to RL. Um, so we have a Markov decision process that is defined on the slide on the left. And uh, we have some sort of initial state that is sampled from the initial state distribution, which could be you know, a fixed initial state or it could be some uh, non-delta um, you know, non distribution. We have a transition uh, function or the dynamics that describes the dynamics of the environment that allows us to compute the next state or basically computes for us the next state after we uh, submit an action from the current state. And we have a policy that could be uh, either deterministic or probabilistic. Uh, finally, we have a reward that assigns the, the, the rewards or utilities to every single state and action pair. Uh, so we introduced two concepts, value functions, uh, vpi and qpi. And we introduced the recursive notion of optimality. So if we have the optimal uh, value functions, so there is this recursive property that holds for them. So, uh, questions for the, for the audience. What, do you remember any of, the, any, any of the graphical models from the class that actually have similar structure for the inference in the form of dynamic programming, like recursive type of uh, inference? Sorry? HMM, yeah, that's, that's a good guess. So HMM and CRF as well. So uh, these these models uh, in these models we had this forward and backward messages uh, that allowed us to uh, to perform inference. Uh, so that's sort of reminiscent of what's 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 happening here. And actually, this is a Markov decision process. So it also has this Markovian property. Um, in, as we will see, we can actually convert it into into a graphical model. All right, so any, any questions so far? It's pretty uh, basic material. Not quite related to probabilistic graphical models, but now we'll, we'll build a connection. So uh, if we have an MDP, right, we can try to represent it in the, form of, uh, in the form of a graphical model. And the graphical model that is given on the slide uh, on the left just describes the Markovian dynamics of the environment. Right? Given a state, and given an action, we treat the states as random variables, we treat actions as random variables. We can uh, write these dependencies that are given on the slide. Uh, the problem is how do we, uh, so, so we, do, we do have controls and we have the state dynamics. The question is like how do we define a distribution not just over any trajectory that is generated by this process. Right? This is a generative graphical model, a, gen a generative model, but we would like to find a distribution over the optimal or rational trajectories. And this, the notion of optimality in RL is captured by the reward. Right? So we need to somehow incorporate the reward into the graphical model. Uh, and ideally, it would be a single graphical model over which we can do learning and inference. Um, all right, so this is the standard MDP. The proposal is that we can augment uh, MDP with some Auxiliary random variables, which we will call uh, you know, optimality random vari variables, right? And now, while having the same initial state transition policy and reward, we'll just additionally add this distribution uh, over some binary random variables. So basically, at every time step, we'll introduce uh, 
a binary random variable whose probability of, B of equal to one, of being equal to one, is equal to the exponent of the reward uh, that we get at state st and action t. Um, right, so uh, this is sort of an arbitrary con construction right now, right? But this would allow us to use this auxiliary variable to be able to condition on them and to, and to ask questions such as, if the trajectory is optimal, or maybe partially optimal, maybe optimal just at this point in time, um, what, what, are, what, are, what, is, what is the possible trajectory in this case? And what is the policy? What should the policy, for example, do? So let's look at this a bit closer. Right? Um, given this graphical model right now, we can run, we can try to learn it, and we can run afterwards queries on it, right? Such as con conditional and, and marginal distributions that we can compute. Um, so we could try uh, to solve control, right, and planning problems, just running inference on the graphical model. Um, the, another good point is that the, this model sort of captures, could capture this notion of not only just optimal behavior, as in this V star and Q star that we can get, um, but also sort of partially optimal, or you know, optimal but almost optimal. Uh, why this is the case? Because we introduce this, this no, the probabilistic notion of optimality. So even if uh, the optimality variable is equal to one, there is some probability that it is equal to one, and the probability is proportional to the reward of the given time step. Um, and finally, so this graphical model can give us some sort of uh, explanation into why you know the st stochastic behavior um, that you know that we you, we could try to infer uh, from the graphical model. So let's say we condition on the optimality, and we get some sort of policy. The policy could be stochastic, but the stochasticity that will be incorporated into this policy uh, might you know allow us to do some sort of smarter exploration within the environment so that we will be able to find certain states uh, that may not be achievable, easily achievable uh, by the agent from the, from the beginning. So this could help from this perspective of exploration and transfer learning point of view. Um, all right, so question. Right, uh, that's a good question. So the question is, is the reward supposed to be negative? Yes. So in this setting, uh, because we assume that this is a valid probability distribution, our reward should be from minus infinity to, to zero. Um, but that's, that's just, so if you have a bounded reward, you can always adjust and shift it to make sure that it's negative. Um, so what can we do with this graphical model? Right, so uh, if I specify a reward function, right, or I fully specify an MDP, uh, I could try to determine what is the likely optimal trajectory, right? So I can try to compute the distribution over all optimal trajectories, and then maybe find the mode, or maybe try to sample trajectories from this distribution. Given an, another 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 point is that given a collection of trajectories that I think are optimal because they are generated by an expert, I could try to infer the reward and maybe some sort of prior over the uh, actions that the, uh, that the expert that generated the trajectory um, has used in their decision making. Right? So it's an attempt to try to approximate someone else making their decisions as if they were a reinforcement learning agent. Uh, right, and finally, like given a reward, we can try to infer the optimal policy. Right? So in this case, we're trying to compute, right, from a graphical model's perspective, we're trying to compute the probability over the trajectories, given the fact that at all time steps we were optimal. Right? And here, we're trying to compute the probability of an action uh, at a given point in time from state S, so that the rest of the trajectory is going to be optimal, right? 
So which action should I take so that I'm optimal from now on into the future? So why is exponent of the reward has to do with anything with the optimality? Um, so what we're saying is that there, we introduce some sort of auxiliary random variable. Right? I'll call it optimality random variable. I know that the higher the reward, the more likely, uh, the more likely my behavior is optimal. Right? That's, how we, that's how we define optimality through rewards or utility function we were trying to optimize. So at a given time point, based on this reward, I can define, technically, I can define this in the form of x. I can define it in some slightly different form, but I can tie together, basically, the probability of being optimal, having taken action at at, at time step st, and the reward that I'm receiving at this point in time. Right? Does that answer the question? Yeah. But so if you observe a sequence of these random variables, Oh. Uh, okay. Right. So, um, technically, you don't observe. Well, you don't observe optimal, even though we denote them as they are observable. We condition on them as if we've observed them. So, let's say we observe a trajectory. If we assume that the trajectory, so we assume that the trajectory is optimal if it came from, let's say, an expert that demonstrates certain behavior, right? And so in that case, we we'll say, well, we observe all these actions and states, and all these O's, by our assumption, uh, are equal to one. So, but we don't observe them in the sense like it's not a, something we sense from the environment or something. But O here is not binary, it's the exponent of the O, so it can be any number. Um, no, I, no, 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 so, so here O is binary. So O is binary, the probability of O, right? Probability of O equal to one is the exponent of the reward. Um, all right, so let's try to derive first the, the distribution over these optimal trajectories. All right, so we start first from the definition of optimality at time step uh, t, and then we can write the, just write out the recurrence over uh, capital T time steps, right? So we're saying that we start from the state S, S1, and then we take an action from every state ST according to some uh, distribution that we'll call action prior. Uh, then we transition to the next state according to the transition or the dynamics of the transition function or dynamics of the environment. And then we also, you know, add this uh, optimality observation, probability of the optimality at the given time step. So we know that the condition, the probability of the trajectory given the optimality is proportional to the joint probability distribution that I wrote on the right-hand side, right? Now we can expand this, we can shuffle this action prior into the exponent uh, that is right next to the reward. I can just regroup them and what we'll get, we'll get basically the uh, probability over the trajectories as well multiplied by the exp of the sum of the cumulative rewards and the corresponding log probabilities of the action prior. So. Uh, this is the construction that was introduced in the tutorial that I linked on the website. Uh, in there, actually, the action, the, the action prior is assumed to be uniform. But it doesn't have to be uniform. So if we a priori have a reason to believe that certain trajectory has certain prior, so for example, we impose a prior on the agent in our grid world to not bump into the walls, right, which is a reasonable prior. Uh, in this construction, right, it would put pretty small or almost like pretty much uh, negligible probabilities on the actions of going into the wall from the states that are adjacent to the, to the walls, right? But for now, let's assume that the action prior is, uh, is uniform. And if, if this is uniform, we can just uh, emit this term. Um, right. So to connect this a bit more 
with what we know about graphical models. Actually, uh, to connect it to CRFs, maybe. Um, we can assume that the rewards functions, let's say, and the uh, prior fu functions are parameterized. So imagine we're given now a bunch of trajectories and we assume that they are optimal, right? The goal that we would like to accomplish is try to infer what are the reward functions, what is the reward function, and what is the maybe the action prior function of the agent that generated these, these trajectories. Um, so what we can do, we can, let's say, parameterize them by some parameters phi and theta, and maybe further assume that they are linear functions uh, in terms of certain features. Right, so let's say we have a set of features fr and a set of features fp, and these features can be computed for a pair of state and action. Uh, and then by combining them linearly, we'll get rewards. Right? We can always assume that, and we can try to learn these, uh, these parameters here, phi and theta, in order to recover the reward and the, um, the prior terms of the of our graphical model, right? And this becomes very, very similar, uh, actually, to the CRF, right? And the CRF, we pretty much had the similar construction where we had linear features. The features were somehow hand-engineered for a sequence of, um, you know, tokens that we had. And uh, basically, they, the, the, the features indicated, in this case, the features indicate some sort of optimality. In that case, features indicated some sort of fit between uh, let's say, sequence of words, or every single word in the sequence, and the corresponding tags or tokens. Um, so in his PhD thesis, Brian Zebert actually derives this construction from uh, max entropy principle. So he doesn't assume anything about the form of the distribution, but here we just uh, jumped ahead and assume that there is this exponential term and the exponential of the reward. or exponential of the features multiplied by some, um, by some parameters. But we'll come back uh, to the uh, previous formulation. We will just assume that the reward is given. So we're interested here in the reinforcement learning setup, not in the inverse setup. Uh, now the next question I'd like to ask is how do we uh, do you know, optimal planning? How do we or plan in this graphical model? How do we uh, uh, infer the optimal policy? Um, and how do we infer like what is the transition probability, what is the probability of the, of the state given that we want to be optimal? So we can do this, and since there is a very pretty direct relationship to CRF and HMM, SRFs and HMMs that we've already covered in the class, uh, you're probably already guessing that it's gonna be something similar to the message passing algorithm that we've covered in the first part of the class. Uh, there will be a forward pass and there will be a backward pass. So we'll introduce these backward messages, right? Probability of, the correspond to probabilities of being optimal from time step t onwards to the capital T, uh, given that we've taken uh, action at from the step st. Uh, we would like to be able to compute this optimal policy, which says that given that I'm in state ST, which action should I take in order to be optimal? And finally, we can also compute the, the forward messages and filter the states in this, in this graphical model. So it allows us to compute these um, alpha STs, which, which answer the question, what is the likely state ST, given that we've acted optimally up until, uh, up until uh, 10 point T minus one. So we will not uh, look at this specific um, component of the model sorry, of the inference, and we'll focus on the first two in this lecture, okay? Right, so first, uh, let's try to compute the backward messages, or basically the probability of being optimal onwards from the current state in action. Uh, and expanding this a bit more, right, we, uh, we can say that, well, th this probability is equal to the, this probability and the, the state st plus one being equ equal to some value. We can integrate out, right? We can integrate out this st plus one. And then this joint probability can further be expanded into the, 
state transition probability that comes from the environment dynamics. The uh, probability of being optimal at time point t. And, you know, this part, which is uh, the probability of being optimal from t plus 1 onwards, given that our state is st plus 1. Okay? So we need to define this term, right? So we'll define this term uh, and name it uh, beta t plus 1, st plus 1. And we can further expand it. So this, this term is basically our, um, our beta t plus 1, uh, st plus 1, a t plus 1, right? So after a series of expansions, we basically got our recurrence relationship between different betas, right? So we can start from the, uh, the beta that we can compute for the very last time step, and then backward rec recurse to compute all beta messages up until the very beginning of the, um, of the graphical model. Right? Yeah. Um, so this is pretty much what we, what we do in, uh, in HMMs and CRFs. Any questions at this point? Right, so, and, and we will see that this relates to the value functions that I introduced at the beginning of the lecture. So what does a value function tell me, an optimal value function tell me? So an optimal value function tells me that uh, if I'm at state S and I execute an optimal policy, the expected, the cumulative uh, discounted returns, expected cumulative discounted returns from this specific state onwards will be equal to certain value, right? Uh, the Q function tells me that if I'm in state S and I'm taking an action A, so I fix these two things, and then afterwards I execute such policy, uh, my return will be that thing. So this is something similar to, uh, to Q and V functions, and actually we'll rename them in just a little bit to, uh, to see this connection. But from the perspective of the graphical model, right, we would like to infer the probability of being optimal in all the sequences onwards, right? Um, right, so actually this, this slide answers your question. So let's rename the log of the beta TST as the uh, VTST, and similarly the log of the beta TST80 as the QST80, right? So in that case, we can also see from the, from the previous relationship that I just wrote on the previous slide, uh, from this line, we can see that VST is equal to log of the integral of the exponent uh, of the QSTAT and this action prior, well, technically we can emit the action prior if the action prior is uniform. So it will be basically log integral exp of the of the q function. And you tell me what is the log integral exp uh, of, of a function? All right, so, so it's approximately max, right? It's a soft max uh, of the, of the basically of the q stat with respect to the action, correct? Sorry, what was the question? Right, it's similar to the log sum exactly, it's similar to the log sum x. It's pretty much log sum x, but instead of sum, we have the integral here. So in case of deterministic dynamics, so what we'll get in this case, uh, we'll get this relation, so we'll, we'll not have, um, you know, if dynamics is deterministic, given a state in action, we specifically know which other state in action we're going to transition to, right? So the recurrence relationship between the beta uh, double argument and beta single argument uh, 
uh, equivalently the relationship between VT and QT will be as given on the slide, which is equivalent to the relationship between the Q function and the V function that are that we have in the standard reinforcement learning in terms of the definitions that I gave you in the beginning of the lecture. Okay? So in case of stochastic dynamics, we observe something slightly uh, slightly odd or different. Uh, so what is happening here is that we take the log of the expectation of the ex exponentiated value function. So what happens is that, so the, the, the problem is, or why this sort of optimistic behavior is not so good, is because we take the expectation over the, over this, the future states. So even if there is a very you know, unlikely future state that we can transition into, but it has a very high value, on top of this high value, we'll also exponentiate this high value, right? And then we'll try to do something, something approximately log sum exp, which is approximately softmax. So what happens is that we will try to, you know, we'll try to take an action such that under the dynamics of the environment, we're likely to, you know, stochastically hit the state that will give us a lot of reward. And this is, this is problematic because basically uh, the policy that we will learn in this sense might be uh, risk seeking. So the policy would try to you know, take the actions that are the riskiest, potentially, but also maybe high risk, high reward type of actions. And also the problem comes from the fact that we have the exponent here. Uh, so basically the exp of the, of the value will try to balance with the low probability of the, of the future state. But we'll see how to address this uh, in, a, in a bit. Now, if we would like to derive the optimal policy, uh, and I'm not going to derive it here. It's going to be actually on the homework. So on homework four, um, you will derive that the optimal policy or the probability of action t given st and being optimal from t to t right can be represented as a ratio of the two of the two messages in our message passing algorithm uh, and if we look at how it is represented in terms of the q and the on in the v functions basically the exponent of the difference between the two and this part uh, is oftentimes called the advantage of taking the action so meaning that if you take an action A as opposed to following the standard policy, instead of value V, you will actually get the value Q. So this is the difference between the two is the advantage of taking the action AT as state SD. Um, so what are, what are the potential benefits of this, of this policy in this form? Well, it has a natural interpretation that better actions are just more probable. So uh, not just in the standard RL, we've seen that our optimal policy in an MDP would be a deterministic policy that would try to take the max or the maximum action over the uh, Q star. But if in Q star, let's say Q star takes the same values for the given state and two different actions, we'll have to break the tie between the two actions and somehow randomly select one of the two. So in this case, uh, the tie breaking is already is already done for you because you have a distribution and then you simply sample from this distribution. Uh, and we can additionally add some temperature parameter inside this exponent, so an, an additional scalar that would either try to focus on sharp peaks, and in that case it will become more deterministic, or the under under the uh, higher temperatures, right? And by temperature I mean uh, we'll add something like one over alpha, where alpha denotes our temperature, and this will be inside the inside the exponent. So in that case, the higher temperatures will allow us for more random behavior, and lower temperatures would be more deterministic, would lead to more deterministic behaviors. All right, just to summarize uh, what we've covered so far, uh, we've introduced some auxiliary random variables. 
they're called optimality random variables. We've augmented uh, our Markov process. With these, we uh, tie these random variables, or their probabilities, uh, of being equal to 1 to the rewards at every uh, single point in time. And we reduce, basically, the optimal control, trying to do optimal control within this graphical model, to inference, right, by computing messages, message passing, uh, by computing forward messages and computing backward messages. Um, we notice that basically solving this MDP in this new form becomes pretty pretty similar to inference in HMM or uh, or CRF. And yeah, the the approach that we've taken so far is very similar to this dynamic programming that people do for uh, with standard value functions v and q. So before moving forward, any questions so far? Okay. So no questions then. I think we are ready to move to uh, to control via variational inference. Right. So there was uh, a problem that we noticed with um, that we noticed with this optimistic behavior in the stochastic case. Uh, the question: Can we fix this? Why does this happen? As well as can we actually relate? And can we relate? Uh, first of all, our inference with some sort of optimization procedure. Right? Because reinforcement learning, as, as I said from the very beginning, was optimization of the stochastic objective function. That is the sum of the uh, expected discounted rewards. Can we, can we relate the inference that we just, just, just derived for this graphical model with, with some optimization problem? Right? Or basically, which objective does this inference procedure optimize? So this is the question we we're trying to ask. And we have this policy you know, in the, on the right-hand side, in the, as in the standard RL, we would like to optimize this expected value function with respect to the policy to get this pi star. On the left-hand side, this is what the inference gives us. Uh, the question is, like, how are they related, right? How are they related? So the answer is we can actually relate the inference procedure. Uh, with some sort of optimization problem. And for that, we need to take a look at the KL divergence between the probability over the trajectories induced by a policy and the probability of optimal trajectories. So let's just write out that part. And so on the left-hand side, we have this uh, probability, right? I would say this should be uh, proportional. So probability of the trajectories that, that are optimal according to this optimality distribution that comes from the rewards. And on the right-hand side, we have let's say, given a, a, some policy pi that is parameterized by some parameter vector. Um, we'll, this, this policy will induce this distribution over trajectories. So you're giving me different policies. I can plug them in and then just get different trajectories. Now, what we would like to minimize, we would like to minimize the KL divergence between the two distributions. So if the policy is optimal, or it acts optimally, the distribution over trajectories that it would produce should technically match the distribution of trajectories that we can get from uh, the, uh, the formulation that we had. Right? Any questions about this formulation? Okay, so to do so, we just expand basically the definitions of this uh, of the KL divergence and uh, the corresponding uh, p hat and p uh, of tau. Uh, we can remove the terms that pretty much coincide for the two, right? Uh, it will arrive with the following formulation. So we'll get the expectation over the trajectories that are sampled from. So this is under our policy, under policy, pi. So the expectation over the trajectories that we get sampled under our policy pi, and then we get sum of the cumulative 
rewards minus the uh, basically the log of the policy at every time step, which is basically reduces reduces to the uh, entropy here, right? So we arrive at we've arrived at this expected returns, right? And we have some sort of entropy bonus. Entropy of the policy. Right? So trying to optimize this objective, we're trying to maximize the expected returns while at the same time behaving as randomly as possible under our policy. So we're trying to find the policy that is as random as possible while at the same time uh, it will get us to high reward, which is pretty, pretty interesting, right? So we've got the standard RL formulation, right? As well as an additional regularization term, if you will, in the objective function. So in case of stochastic dynamics, and I'm not going to derive this uh, on the slides, but the, the expression will be slightly different. Uh, and similarly, we'll get this problem with the uh, sort of optimistic, optimistic transition, right? Where we're trying, to, where the policy would try to, to, to be pretty much uh, risk seeking. So the question I'd like to ask is why, uh, why does this happen in case of the stochastic dynamics, right? Why does the policy is trying to exploit, in some sense, the, the dynamics of the environment, despite the fact that, um, you know, in the standard RL, that doesn't happen, right? Um, so it turns out that there is this dichotomy between the, the be, between two reasons, right? There are two reasons of why we could have achieved a high reward. One reason is that we execute, we had a really good policy, and we executed, uh, a nice sequence of actions, and we've attained a very high reward because of that. And um, so basically, that's what this term tells us, the optimal policy that conditions on the optimality uh, of the future sort of states and actions that says that given that we obtained a very high reward, right, what was our action probability? And that's what we're interested in. We'd like to find the policy that actually result in this high probability. The other thing that sort of confounded with the first one is this optimal transition probability, right? We could ask a question, given that we've obtained a very high reward, what was our transition probability that led us to this high reward? From the perspective of the graphical model that we have, these two things are sort of symmetrical. So we can ask both questions, and in terms of like the queries that we can run uh, on the graphical model, I mean, they will return some sort of result. But in terms of the second one, this is the one that we really don't want to happen. Um, this is because the dynamics of the environment, and we know it a priori, that the dynamics of the environment is actually unaffected by the actions of the policy. So we cannot control the dynamics of the environment, and therefore asking this query in this, in this sense that, that I wrote on the slide, the second query, is technically invalid because we know that the dynamics is actually fixed, right? So, but when we do this inference and we try to, uh, to let's say, compute the Q function or we we'll try to compute under the stochastic dynamics, right? Uh, graphical model is unaware of this in some sense. So it will produce some sort of conditional distribution for us. Uh, and uh, generally speaking, it will not be enforced to be equal to the actual transition probability. Does that you know, make sense? Or any questions about this? Is it clear or unclear? Okay, no questions. Everyone understands everything. Cool. So um, the point is that I'm trying to make is that uh, 
we would like to incorporate this additional notion of uh, fixed dynamics, or the fact that we cannot affect the dynamics, into the way how we try to solve the, the problem, into the way how we try to optimize the problem. So you can actually uh, introduce some variational distribution, right? and we've done a variational inference of this class. So instead of trying to compute, sometimes computing the, uh, you know, the posterior distribution, or, or this posterior distribution, uh, could be intractable. So try to approximate it with a variational family. In this case, we would try to approximate it with a variational family, but also not because it is intractable, but because we would like to impose certain assumption, and in this case, the assumption on the transition probability, that the transition from state under taken actions shouldn't change. Um, so basically, the question that we would like to or basically the formulation that I would like to, to use is given that we obtained a very high reward, what was our, or the agent's action probability, right, given that the transition probability what didn't change. Right, so we explicitly would like to incorporate that. So for that, we'll define this Q function, or the variational function, which will be also the Q of tau, right, the distribution over the trajectories such that it approximates this posterior, right? Or the probability over trajectories given that we're optimal all the time, while it, the dynamics stays fixed. So how do we do this? Uh, we'll define the Q distribution as is given on the slide right now. So it's just the probability of the first state, the probability of the dynamics, and then finally, uh, our policy, which, which will denote QA, just to you know, highlight the relationship between, uh, highlight the fact that this is a new, uh, a new component of the distribution. Right, so what happens is that the original graphical model is on the top here, and what we would like to do, we would like to infer this posterior probability, the conditions of the observations, but at the same time, we would like to approximate it with this Q that we just specified above. So we're trying to approximate the posterior with some variational distribution. And the graphical model for the variational distribution would be, uh, would be slightly different. It will not depend on these optimality variables. So in the standard variational framework, notation, right? We can say that we have this probability of z given x, so we have probability of q. Uh, if you remember, we had this graphical model of trying to infer, so basically a graphical model where we have latent causes, we have observations, in this case observations are the optimality variables, and we're trying to approximate this posterior of z given x with this q. Um, all right, so how do we do this? Well, we're gonna do pretty much the same thing. We're gonna write out the optimal uh, distribution over trajectories. We're gonna write out the produced distribution over trajectories by the policy. And now I will just write the log probability of the evidence. So remember, the observations are these optimality variables. That we assume that all of them are set to one and therefore we assume that we, we observe them. So I will just expand this as a, into a full probability distribution, and then I will add and I will uh, multiply and divide the distribution by the variational distribution, and then we can use the Jensen's inequality, right? Jensen's inequality to compute the lower bound. So, Basically, we use this very, the very same variational inference trick that we use uh, in the standard VI, and we get this elbow objective that we can try to optimize with respect to the policy. And in this case, the policy is our QAS. Okay. All right, so this is our new objective. Now we can. So let's, let's go back one more time. Uh, let's expand the terms here and here. And what we get, well, 
we get again the log probabilities over the initial states, log probabilities over the transitions, and now the log probabilities of the transitions match. Uh, if we were to use the uh, inference, so if we were to do this DKL kind of thing uh, with stochastic dynamics, we wouldn't have, uh, we wouldn't be able to sort of cancel them. And then finally, log probability of the optimality variables, which are the rewards and the log QA given S's. And then, well, not surprisingly, we, we, get, we again get uh, the uh, standard RL term, right? The expected returns. Uh, as well as the entropy of the policy. Or in this case, entropy of the actions. Right. So again, we get a reward that is augmented by, by an additional term that, that is called the, uh, that is coming from the entropy of, of the policy. And what we're trying to do, we're try we can try to optimize this objective with respect to the policy to recover, um, the, um, to recover basically the policy that, that approximates or basically solves, solves the MDP, the augmented MDP that we define. Okay. So maybe a few more derivations. So once we've, uh, once we've derived the, the lower bound, now we could try to solve and actually recover this Q of A T given S T. Uh, and we'll start with the base case. So we'll compute Q A T given S T for the very final step. We can show that is, it is minimized when um, it is proportional to the x of the reward at this final step. And uh, basically, we'll arrive again at our exponential, exponential term. Basically, the exponent of the difference between the q stat minus v st, where this q and v, again, are defined through the betas and messages that we, we defined before. And we can similarly recursively uh, compute this q atst at every time step, and recurs back from the uh, from the final state all the way to the very first state, or the state that we're at right now, uh, in order to compute the um, in order to compute the the optimal so so in order to compute the optimal action. And if you do all these all these computations, you will, what will happen is that you can see that the the minimizer will be proportional to the exponent of the Q S T A T. Right. So what we've arrived at with this sort of fixed dynamics and variational inference is that we now recovered again the standard uh, Bellman backup as the one that we have in the deterministic dynamics. Now in the stochastic dynamics, under in this augmented MDP kind of framework, we can still get pretty much uh, the same uh, you know, regular backup operator, right? So we no longer suffer from this optimism because we explicitly fixed in our variational distribution the fact that the transition fun the, the transition uh, probabilities are not changing. So the, the agent doesn't doesn't affect them. Um, all right. So just to summarize what we've uh, we've gone through. So first of all, we we've defined this extended uh, Markov decision process with uh, auxiliary optimality random variables that allow us to basically answer a bunch of queries by doing inference, right? We can compute the optimal trajectory as well as we can compute the uh, optimal policy or optimal probability of actions at every given state. Uh, we would be also able to, if we are given a bunch of optimal trajectories, we can use pretty much the same framework to learn what the reward is, what is the reward that might have led to these trajectories. Um, the whole framework is super similar to HMMs and CRFs, which is a huge benefit. Uh, and uh, there could be variants of that. So we ran into this problem of optimism, and we fixed this problem of optimism by using variational inference. And, you know, this is just the framework that allows us 
you know, to pose and formulate the problem. What we're interested in, in the end of the day, is to, um, you know, derive an algorithm or reinforcement learning algorithm that can help us actually search for policies and find these policies that we can eventually take and, you know, after learning in the environment, we can put them and execute them uh, and make the agents basically use the policies. Um, there are some variations that I mentioned um, where we can introduce some sort of temperature in order to be able to control the stochasticity of the, of the agent um, of the agent's policy. So the higher the temperature, the more stochastic actions the agent would take. Uh, so we can explicitly use that to trade off the stochasticity of the agents and uh, you know, potentially enable better, better exploration. Any questions? Okay, so if there are no questions, uh, that's it for today. In the next lecture, we're gonna cover, we're gonna focus on some algorithms that actually derived from this framework or maximum entropy uh, reinforcement learning algorithms.